Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Client and Advisor Forum. My name is Roman Alpert, and I'm a Senior Portfolio Manager here at City National Rockdale. I'm excited to introduce today's webinar, Active Management, Achieving Client Goals During Turbulent Times. Our speakers today are CEO Garrett D'Alessandro, and for the first time in our webinar series, our Chief Investment Officer, Matt Perrone. Most of you in our audience today know Garrett, who joined State National Rockdale in 1986. In his role as CEO, he sets the strategic direction of the firm and assists in determining the macroeconomic outlook and asset allocations for the firm's strategies. Matt Perrone joined City National Rockdale in March of this year. As CIO, he is responsible for developing the firm's investment philosophy, overseeing the firm's asset allocation and investment strategies, and managing the equity and fixed income team. A few logistics before we get started. We encourage you to ask questions by typing them into your console's Q&A window at any time during the session. We will address questions at the end of the presentation and will try to answer as many as possible with the time we have allotted. Please note that a copy of the slides can be downloaded from the resources window to the right of your console screen. With that said, let's get started. Thank you both for joining us today. Garrett, I'll hand things over to you for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Roman. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm pleased uh, to have our new CIO, uh, Matt Perrone, uh, who will give a little bit of, of his background, um, lead uh, this conversation. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize that uh, now where we are in the cycle, not just economically, but in terms of asset classes, uh, I feel very confident that together uh, with our advisor partners, RIAs and BDs, we're going to add tremendous value uh, to uh, what we do for clients over the next couple of years. And we've already been hard at work at that, and we're going to articulate uh, some of that work within the asset classes. I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who will lead us through the conversation. Great. Thank you, Garrett. And uh I'm very, very happy to be here and be with everybody. Look forward to working with everybody. Um, so as Garrett mentioned, the key really at this point is to figure out where we are in the cycle. And our outlook for the uh, economy s starts with um, navigating. We have the title, Navigating the Global Cross Currents, because that's really what we are seeing now, more and more cross currents uh, in the economy. Now. I know the uh, economics is not everyone's favorite subject here, so bear with me, but we have to lay down some foundational groundwork that is really key to figuring out the question that Garrett's asking. Where are we in the cycle, and how is that cycle then going to impact markets? And that's really what this webinar is about today. So uh, here are uh, the positives and the negatives or the cautionary signs that we see in the economy as I mentioned, there are cross currents because while up, up until now they've generally been pretty strongly on the positive side, we've had a nice wind at our back in terms of the economy gradually improving, uh, the markets coming alongside with it very nicely. Uh, but now as, we, as the cycle ages going forward, uh, there will be more cross currents. There will start to be some headwinds uh, that we need to deal with. And as Garrett mentioned, um, we have to navigate those to really, uh, and, and there'll be opportunities to really add value uh, if we navigate them successfully. So we're hard at work uh, looking at the, the different uh, cross currents. I want to be clear, I'll give you the punchline, that the positives still outweigh the negatives. And we think, and I'll demonstrate this later on in our discussion, that there is a good few years to go, probably two years to go in this cycle. And we get it that a number of different and uh, independent indicators that many of which you'll see today and many more that we track in the background. So again, the key is the positives still outweighing the negatives. We'll go through that. We'll build up our case for why, why that's the case um, through our analysis today. And hopefully you'll come away um, feeling uh, somewhat confident that at least that we uh, – we have some time to go. All right. You've seen this before. These are our speedometers. 
Uh, underneath these are a myriad uh, uh, indicators, metrics, data series, economic series that we track. We roll them up into a qualitative assessment as to where we are for each of these indicators. We have 20 indicators here. Right now, we still see 17 in the green. So still positives outweighing the negatives. Uh, we'll go through a couple of the ones that are in green. We'll, um, but before we do that, I really want to take you through some of the key ones, uh, again, that we use in our building block approach towards assessing the economy. So let's start with uh, surveys. The manufacturing surveys in particular, um, they indicate that, that, that there's confidence growing in the economy. We're at new cycle highs in our surveys, in the ISM surveys, in other surveys that we track, and of course in our own work when we talk to CEOs and we, uh, we're out in the field uh, assessing the business environment. So this is a very good sign because that means that the, that the animal spirits of the economy are picking up and that people feel confident that they can spend, they can invest, and that, of course, drives uh, uh, growth, economic activity. One of the things that's come up of late is the headlines around the trade war. And we're, one of the reasons why we're, I wanted to put this slide up front is because uh, you would see in the surveys, if there was really concern that we'd have a trade war bro breaking out, you'd see pause on management and manufacturing activity uh, first, probably before you'd see it anywhere else. And so we're tracking that. And what I infer from this is that we don't see a lot of concern at this point that we're going to have a broad and economically damaging trade war. And, and that comports with our own view, which we'll get into. So coming back to that very important point that uh, Garrett had uh, pointed out, which is where are we in the cycle? I really want to focus on the right side of this slide, and I know it's a bit of a busy slide. But uh, this, this, to me, the right side is the output gap. So actual versus potential uh, economic activity. And what you've seen is that we've gradually closed this gap over the past eight or nine years. And so we're getting to the point where we're at potential. And this is very important because we know that when we get to this point, we usually have a few years to go. So this is indicator number one, that we still have a few years to go in this cycle. So that's very important. As you can see in prior cycles, there was a number of years before uh, a recession hit after we got to this point in the cycle. So one of the things you'll read about quite a bit is, while wow, the cycle is so long, it's longest, therefore it's got to end soon. And we don't think time is the best measure of the duration of this cycle. We think other measures that we're presenting today, such as this one, is a far better way of looking at the economy and, and judging where we are. And given how gradual this recovery has been, it's, it's, given, it's taken more time to get to where we are. And as a result, it's not unreasonable to expect that uh, that, that growth can, can uh, continue for a few more years based on this view of the economy. Switching to unemployment, another very important series we track, of course. Unemployment, you see that line straight down. And it, it also typically gives us a view as to where we are in the cycle. But this cycle has been very different. And underneath this chart lies two very important uh, uh, indicators that we track that really tell the story. And the first is the composition of the labor force has been very different than prior cycles. One key aspect of this recovery has been the fact that the, the elderly, or I should say more advanced in age, uh, uh, part of the workforce has actually refused to retire. They have stayed in the workforce longer. Their share, the baby boomer share of workforce is at 23%, which is the highest ever going back to 1948, that you had that age cohort stay in the workforce. So that has actually kept a lid on wages um, in, for a number of different reasons, and as a result has prolonged the cycle by, by uh, dampening wage growth. The second phenomenon that we're tracking is the 25 to 55 year old cohort of workers that's underneath this series. And if you look at that graph, it's been depressed. 
Uh, but recently, it started turning and it's going up. And you'll see that in the wage data, et cetera, which is a key indicator of how, how much room will the, the Fed have. So we think tracking that age group in the unemployment, in the labor market, is going to be very important to determining the wage pressures that will be moving through the system. And if you look at that series, we think we have two more years to go before that series gets to the prior cycle high. And then bringing it back to this graph, that means that we think unemployment could get down to 3.5% before we're at peak uh, uh, of the cycle. So again, if you just take that and extrapolate it in time, you, you get another two years before we're, we're there. Okay, so another data point to, to why the cycle has still room to run. Let's switch now to corporate profits. Corporate profits are unusually strong for this part of the cycle. Um, even putting aside the tax cuts, which have boosted profits by about 7 or 8%, we're seeing a very uh, high level of uh, profit growth. It's actually driven by an uptick in revenue growth, which is a very positive sign. Uh, in, so first quarter numbers, every time I look, they're revised up, but it looks like we're going to come in over 20% this quarter. Quite amazing. Um, again, there's some tax cuts in there, but when you annualize for the year, our expectation as shown on this chart, and you can see the buildup of how we get there, is for about 14% earnings growth for the year. And again, that's, those numbers have been coming up so soon. Uh, recently. So our overweight in U.S. equities is grounded in this strong outlook for corporate profits. And this earnings, the earnings story, which usually drives stock prices, you can look at headlines, you can look at uh, any other valuations, et cetera, but the number one driver of stock prices, which we'll get into, is earnings. So that's very uh, positive development. Okay, so let's put it all together, uh, and Garrett, I guess I'll come back to your, keep coming back to your question. We just don't see recession risk as imminent. Our, our assessment is that we have less than 30%. Uh, so therefore, I guess I'd characterize us, Garrett, as probably mid-cycle um, and maybe getting a little uh, moving into the later parts of the cycle, but not yet very late in the cycle. So. Um, consistent with some of the indicators I talked about. So I'll tie it all up uh, with our, our economic outlook at a glance, the, the positive economic fundamentals, jobs, housing are very much intact. Housing is a great story I didn't touch on, but that is actually improving quite a bit. Um, and uh, that is a major drive of the economy, and that, and that cycle has certainly some room to run. And inflation stable, that's very important. So um, despite some of the recent cyclical uptick in inflation, we think that remains contained. We'll get into that. Uh, but that, that gives us a lower for longer rate view, uh, 275 to 325 on the 10-year. Uh, and that um, uh, will uh, keep the economy in that sweet spot for some time to come. So that's it for that session, uh, section, Garrett. I uh, hope that wasn't too tedious for those who really hated their economics class. Yep. All right. So I'm going to now bring us to the risks. So what are we focused on? What's the risk to the story? What could derail us from this, this sweet spot that we've been talking about? So first and foremost is a policy error or or Conversely, the Fed having to go faster than they would otherwise, than we would like them to go, and therefore ending the cycle earlier. That's risk number one. And I'm very sorry that this chart is so busy and so complex, but it's a very important point. So bear with me just for a minute. On the left, which is really where I want you to focus, we see that the Fed policy rate is still in negative real uh, uh, terms and it's below the neutral rate. So that means. We are still accommodative. When just a, a year ago or so, we would have called this stimulative, but now we'll call it accommodative because the lower the, the blue line is below the, the green line, then the, uh, the Fed is stimulating the economic activity. As the blue line approaches 
the green line, that stimulation is removed, but we've moved into an accommodative zone before it becomes at some point in the future will become restrictive. So again, we probably have a year or two before we're firmly in restrictive territory, and that backs up our, our view about the economy having a few more years to run. You'll note that the blue line is pretty, uh, usually goes above the green line um, and above 2% before a recession kicks in. So um, it, it's not indicating that we have a recession uh, imminently. So inflation is key. What could cause the Fed to have to move faster? And the inflation is typically what uh, causes the Fed to, sort of, to have to remove the punch bowl. And in this case, um, we have a, a, a balanced story here we'll talk about a cyclical versus secular. So we have uh, recent data on inflation has been a little stronger uh, through the wage channel, but uh, we believe that that's been anticipated by the market to a certain extent and to be expected. So at times that's going to cause some dislocation in the market, some volatility, which we'll talk about. Um, but And so we know that that's coming and it's probably a primary reason that we'll get some market volatility but we don't think inflation pressures will be sustained. And the main reason for that is because of what's on the left side of the chart of the table below. And these are secular forces that are keeping a lid on or dampening the inflation impulse that we would get through the economy. So number one, first and foremost, is the, the demographics that I mentioned. The, the baby boomers, the globalization of the workforce. I mentioned baby boomers just are, are not retiring and the, the effect of that is to keep a, a lid on wages. Another equally, if not as important and durable reason is technology. So one of the things that we get to do is talk to a lot of CEOs and the companies that we own out uh, meeting in the field um, and a persistent theme is that they're really working on automation in, of every business process from robotics to uh, their, their back office tech, um, and um, using predictive analytics, et cetera. So the technology boom has really uh, been putting uh, a lid on wages as well uh, because we get to substitute uh, labor for capital in many cases. And these innovations are quite astounding as we see that some of the things that are coming up um, are really interesting. And we can get into it in Q&A if you'd like. But we were speaking with um, a scientist who's sequencing genes. And it used to uh, the, uh, take uh, days and $10,000. This is just five years ago, four years ago, to sequence um, a, um, a tissue sample. And now, for example, that, that same sequencing could be done in under an hour and for about $800. So, uh, and there are many examples of robotics that are just improving the factory for, floor. We talked to a CEO who's setting up a new factory in a low power district in the U.S. and saying that, you know, he knew, needs one eighth of the workers that he um, would otherwise use. So, very powerful forces keeping a lid on inflation. All right. Another risk that often comes up, and you read about this in the newspaper quite a bit, is valuations. We hear this all the time, uh, or there's a headline, the market is so expensive, sell, sell, sell. And I don't think you can have a, uh, a valuation discussion without talking about your forecast for interest rates. And as you can see from this chart, uh, there is a, quite a, uh, an empirical relationship between P.E. ratios and, uh, and bond rates. And in this case, we plotted the 10-year uh, Treasury yield. And what you see is that there's a pretty definitive relationship going back in history. You also see that where we are now isn't really out of line. And if you remember from your textbooks, the, the present value of the cash flows depends on the interest rates. And so it's very uh, a very well-worn uh, reason why this would be the case. It's actually just math. It's simple algebra that you would have higher valuations in a lower rate environment. So these uh, valuations are not out of line 
uh, when you look at it in the context of rates. So we're not saying that the market is very cheap here, but we think that the calls for, you know, sell and panic and all that are very overdone uh, because uh, valuations could stay here. And it depends on your outlook for rates, and that's why I wanted to get that the, the our outlook um, uh, laid down before we talked about the markets because it's very important. All right. Another risk is trade tensions. We hear a lot about this. We see a lot about this in the headlines. There's quite a bit of um, hand-wringing on this topic now, and it, that's understandable, and I'll get into that. We've written a paper on this um, a special bulletin. If you haven't seen it, please let us know. But it really is about how uh, trade tensions, we think these trade war is mostly headlines and not necessarily at this point an economic event. And we understand why, if you look at the, the, the gray line on the left chart, that the trade deficit is quite big and has been getting bigger, um, despite the fact that, say, the services uh, trade is in, actually in surplus. But coming back to the, the, the why, why, why does trade talk rattle the market? And it rattles the market because the, the the story of globalization has really underpinned uh, a, lot, a large part of, this, of one of the big stories of this recovery, and that is manufacturing margins. And when you look at margins in manufacturing center since, in sector since China joined the WTO, margins have really gone nothing but straight up. And so anything that messes with that balance would be a worry for the market. So it's understandable that the market can – uh, be nervous about it, but we're a long way from reversing that. There would be a lot of things that would have to change. So again, we think at this point that's more headline, but we're of course watching it because of its far-reaching implications. So again, put it all together. I didn't do an exhaustive list, of course, to uh, to uh, keep things contained here in the in our webinar. But uh, when you put it all together. Uh, we wanted to focus on the economic outlook because when you have uh, an economic cycle that does not go, when you're not in the recession part of the economic cycle, it's generally um, unusual to see a bear market. And as you can see from this chart, 80% 80, 80 of the time uh, there, there has been a bear market concomitant with a recession, and only once or twice have you seen uh, uh, what we would call a flash crash or something like that, like you saw in 1987, where uh, you'll have a bear market without a recession. And those are typically short-lived and, and, in fact, buying opportunities. That's what I would call a market mistake. So, Garrett, um, those were the risks that we're, we're focusing on. Um, uh, we will um, – I'll wrap that up and uh, before we get on to our next session. Good. Okay. So how is the market environment changing? And uh, so again, I'm going to come back to valuations for a minute just to make a broader point. So one of the things that, that you'll see out in the uh, popular press is the CAPE ratio, and this is a long-term valuation measure for those of you who are not familiar with it. It looks at 10-year earnings and valuations and tries to get a sense at what prospective long-term returns will be. And CAPE ratios typically are, do a good job of, of um, forecasting five- and ten-year uh, forward returns for the market. So people look at this and say, oh, wow, look at our, our current CAPE ratio is very, very elevated, and therefore sell, 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 or you'll see all kinds of uh, – Notes coming out, I think the most popular is Cape Fear or something like that. I've seen a lot of those headlines. We, we urge a bit of caution before using that as any way to time the market. Um, and so what I want to separate for you today is what's good about the Cape ratio and what's not as useful. So I'll start with what's not as useful. It's not a great indicator for, for, for short periods of time, anything less than five years. Um, the second thing is that it does change. So, for example, in the 10-year history, we still have a great recession. So we have a big earnings gap, um, and that will roll off in the next year or two. So the CAPE ratio will actually come down 
if our view of the economy is right, which is to say we don't have a recession in the next year, the CAPE ratio will naturally come down. It still won't come down to cheap levels, but it'll come down to more reasonable and less, less alarmist levels. But the most uh, important thing about uh, the CAPE ratio is that it does say, and we agree with this, that returns going forward for the next five and 10 years will be more moderate than it has been in the past five and 10 years, which have been quite impressive results. We won't see those going forward. So takeaway number one is uh, to, to not read uh, too much into the exact levels, but to look at the contours of the CAPE ratio, and that's certainly telling us not to, um, uh, to, to not expect uh, wide-based returns. But it also is the saying, don't, you don't need to sell. And Garrett, it reminds me of that saying, I think it was Peter Lynch who said, that more money has been lost anticipating a correction than in the correction itself. Right. So when people overreact to this, they uh, uh, often do so um, at their own peril. The second key theme of how we see the market moving, uh, or, or the market dynamics, I should say, progressing, is volatility. So we've already seen some this year. You all uh, know about that. And we just wanted to put it in context and show that this volatility, while it's certainly no fun to go through, it's not atypical. And you can see in this chart, just looking at the red bars, that we're still in the range, in this blue range, that uh, volatility levels, these are average, these are uh, worst drawdowns per year. We're still in a range that we've seen before. So we're, we, we not only think this is normal, we expect more of this to come, unfortunately. So that's our second takeaway from how the market dynamic is changing. So how are we going to navigate the, the, this volatility, the more moderate returns? Uh, one of the things that we're going to have to do is just be more agile. Uh, it, you know, we'll yearn for the days of uh, putting your money in an index fund and, and letting, it, letting it ride, and you don't have to really think about it, uh, the good old days of, of 2016 and 2017. But in fact, uh, it's going to get harder. And when you get later in the cycle, you do need to be more agile, more adept uh, at navigating the market from a number of uh, standpoints, both from the stocks and, and bonds that you pick, but also from how you uh, uh, do asset allocation. So those, uh, this is going to be a key dynamic. And what we show here in this chart is that as you get later in the cycle, you typically get higher valuations, and you, you typically get um, uh, more returns to uh, picking value stocks or picking stocks that have quality and value, and we're going to get into a little bit of how we're reacting to that in a moment. And those are typically very productive. Uh, likewise, when we get into a down market, uh, which we will have at some point, uh, we will see uh, active managers really earning their keep then because they really tend to shine during, during turbulent markets and down markets in particular. So they will hopefully protect capital, and that's the expectation that we have this cycle. All right, so how are we at City National Rockdale responding to, to all of this? And I just wanted to remind everybody of, of what the value add that we provide. It's really threefold. We have three layers here. And the top is we're, we're asset allocators, and I'll get into our process for that, but we, ask, we do asset allocation um, to navigate these cross currents. That's very important. Second is we personalize. We, we, we come back and we sequence your, your, your investment DNA and we tailor the portfolio to your risk and return objectives. And that's really important because that will help also um, navigate uh, what, what could be more turbulent markets. And then finally, we have, and this is really unique, and this, this, this gets me very uh, excited, um, and it's a little nerdy, I get that, but uh, we have uh, unique sources of return premia. And what that means is we source uh, uh, returns from different parts of the market that are not in your usual toolkit of stocks and bonds, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And, that, and that's really additive to client uh, portfolios uh, over time, and I'll show, I'll demonstrate that. So let's start with the asset 
allocation. The, the, the mandate of the asset allocation team is, first of all, to protect capital. So let's manage our exposure to the downside. Be careful. Uh, don't, you know, capture, ex, ca capture returns when you can see them. And then when you see trouble on the horizon, protect capital. So we want to participate in the upside, protect the downside. We have a very active asset allocation committee. By active, I mean we meet frequently. We're always talking, always comparing um, metrics, speedometers, data series, et cetera, um, and constantly keeping an eye on any data, data source from rail car loadings to, you know, hundreds of data series that we track. Uh, to, you know, to imports and shipments and producer prices, et cetera, to really understand what's going on. And then we bring our experience to bear to say, okay, what matters and what's, what's noise? And that's really important. And Gary mentioned in the beginning that, you know, being through different cycles is important. Um, and all of us on the Asset Allocation Committee have th been through many cycles and have seen the different ways, how different cycles have reacted to different uh, type of, of uh, events. So that's very important, uh, first and foremost. The second is the personalization that I mentioned. This is uh, very important. We bring all of these tools to bear uh, to, to understand your objectives, risk tolerances. Um, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to be able to do that. And I think of asset allocation as a, as a blunt instrument. We can do that across in the, the whole uh, platform. But the personalization we really do, that's more of a surgical tool to really get into uh, portfolio construction um, to, to a particular uh, uh, set of uh, objectives. So the unique set of benefits for clients, the, the return premium that I mentioned earlier on, again, gets me very excited as CIO because we can be creative, and the team has done a terrific job at this finding different sources of return premia all around the globe, if you will, to bring those to bear to clients. And really, Steve National Rockdale, in my view, is very unique and really uh, interesting uh, and very appealing to me in particular because you get to bring these tools and pro provide a differentiated experience. So what we did here um, is plot the what's called the efficient frontier of the average advisor that we, we downloaded from uh, the Research Affiliates data source that has the average, average advisor allocation and the tools at their disposal. And you can construct a whole set of portfolios that give you a certain risk and return trade-off. But that, there's only a limit to what you can do, and that's illustrated by the red line. If you don't have any differentiated sources of returns, like our opportunistic fixed income fund, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you're not able to improve upon, you can't go outside the red line. But we have uh, tools or return premium that we can access and we have done uh, to improve upon the risk return uh, the trade off that we can provide, and that's the blue line. So that to me is very exciting and really is a limit to the creativity that we have a team have to, to bring these return premium to bear to client accounts, to client portfolios, and uh, improve their risk return trade off and again gives us more degrees of freedom to tailor the portfolio to specific objectives. So I know a little nerdy, but uh, it's something that gets a CIO uh, excited. So there you have it. Okay, so um, what, what have we uh, done lately? What actions are we taking to respond to this market environment? And this uh, is, we've done a number of things, and I'll walk through a couple of them. In our uh, large cap core uh, equity uh, uh, portfolio, we've moved up in quality and um, anticipating the turbulence. Early in the cycle, you, it's okay to have companies that are a little bit leveraged. Matter of fact, it benefits them when the rates are lower. You have more leverage. Um, and you're able to uh, refinance your debt, et cetera. Debt is easy to come by. As you get later in the cycle, that becomes less true. And so lower quality, over leveraged companies typically struggle. So we've moved up uh, the quality spectrum in our uh, large cap core um, strategy. 
we also have taken the, the growthiness of the portfolio down a little bit more towards a core exposure uh, because as rates rise, uh, there are a number of impacts that that will have on longer duration equities. And so as a result, we think being more towards co core um, and uh, has been uh, uh, to our advantage. And both of those moves have been very productive, have added significant value to the fund, uh, which is uh, having a, a very nice run here. So for example, we've We've added Berkshire Hathaway to the to the fund, and, and that gives you an idea of the, the type of, of uh, moves that we're making. All right. Um, second thing that we've done is uh, our, I talked about our opportunistic fixed income fund. This has been a, a terrific uh, addition to the portfolio. Uh, it's returned uh, has four and a half percent roughly for the past five years. Yet doing so with a quarter less volatility than your typical high yield fund. So it's giving you a nice yield, but with lower volatility, and that's why it's earned a five-star rating in Morningstar. So this is a credit vehicle that, I that really uh, captures what I was talking about earlier. It has unique return premium inside it to provide uh, a, a sort of more stable, less uh, beta to the, to the overall market uh, and bond uh, uh, exposures. So it's very unique in that regard, and that really is what enables us to improve that efficient frontier that I talked to you about. So that's been, that's been very exciting um, uh, for us. And then lastly, uh, in our, um, I shouldn't say lastly, it's Pentultimate, is our HDI strategy, which has been a big income generator for clients. And when fixed income is not, e yielding very much to have a 4% uh, or better yield from, from this strategy has been very helpful. And that has been returned 7% um, annual for 10 years. Um, and so that, again, has been very helpful. What we're doing there now is pivoting towards higher growth. So uh, we are moving the portfolio from um, yield with some growth to higher growth uh, uh, dividend payers, and that we think at this part of the cycle will be very uh, interesting, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, and then finally, in international equities, City National Rockdale's had a very interesting insight, in my in my opinion, and very unique and differentiated. In that, it has had uh, an exposure, an expressed uh, exposure to international equities through emerging markets Asia, and they get to this, and I have a slide on this next, um, it's a very interesting way that we've gotten to this conclusion, but it's been a very productive um, uh, uh, move for us to have that exposure and express our international exposure through that region. And again, I'll explain that in a minute, but the results have been pretty impressive. It's just, just being overweight emerging markets Asia versus emerging markets has added 300 basis points per year in the past five years. So that regional bet has been very productive. And of course, our fund uh, has added an extra 100 basis points or more uh, on top of that. So um, very insightful move by the team. Okay, um, let's come back to um, spend a minute, I should say, on Emerging Markets Asia. We, uh, we're doing some work on this. We'll have some thought pieces around um, explaining this using something called our four P's framework, which really is a more of a demographic look at the various regions around the globe and why we get to emerging markets Asia as our preferred region. So the simple answer is better growth, reasonable valuations, but that really doesn't tell the whole story. We have a very competitive workforce, a favorable demographic dependency ratio, um, we have a per capita income band that's really in the sweet spot. They're moving, moving up very nicely, and that's a, that's a trend that will continue for years, if not decades. Uh, so that story is very powerful. And when you put it through our four-piece framework, uh, you can see a, a durable and lasting reason why one would want to keep exposure to, uh, to, to this region. So uh, again, we're going to write, you're going to see a white paper from us on this topic in the coming months, and I think it'll really lay out why we've made the choices that we have. Okay, so um, 
I am going to just wrap up by uh, talking about our uh, results here. Um, very briefly, the asset allocation calls that we have made over the past years have been productive, as I mentioned, and this includes that um, the, the, the selection that we made around uh, sourcing those return premia. So uh, in there, when you add it all up, it, it's been a good ride for the whole market, and um, uh, in particular, C National Rockdale has done a uh, you know very respectable job of trying to drive uh, very competitive returns. We feel pretty good about what we've done there. So um, let me just close the this part of my prepared remarks, just focusing on our um, our our return expectations. You've seen these before. We put these out um, monthly, but um, you'll see in the green that the risk assets in general on the left, uh, we, we still see very favorable returns versus fixed income. So we're overweight. Those green bars, we still see opportunity to um, provide excess return through that opportunistic credit product we talked about, the fixed in, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the opportunities fund, sorry. And of course, high yield muni is still also very attractive to us in a in taxable context. Uh, finally, to sum up our positioning, so given where we are in the cycle, coming back to that all-important question, we still are overweight risk. We prefer the U.S. and the um, in for uh, equities and large cap in particular. Uh, we still think dividend income, uh, which has been challenged in the first quarter, um, and I'll get into that in some Q and A um, on our outlook. But we still think that will be productive. International, we're focused on EM Asia, as I mentioned, and of course opportunistic fixed income that I mentioned. So, Roman, that's that's it from here. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you both for this timely presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that questions can be submitted through the Q and A window on your console. It looks like we already have quite a few questions teed up from our audience, so I'll dive right into it. Matt, looks like the first couple of these will go to you. Would you see any advantage of having a style shift toward value? If not, why not? Yeah, that's a great question. Value has underperformed growth by um, a pretty astonishing amount this cycle, and especially recently uh, when you look at uh, the returns to value versus growth, and this is very anomalous compared to history. So it might lead one. I can understand that the, the nature of the question. It might lead you to say, "Well, should a, does a value tilt make sense?" And I spoke many times about this with uh, Tom Galvin, who runs our large cap core strategy. who's done a, a terrific job of navigating the growth value spectrum. And as I mentioned earlier, he's moved back from a growthy tilt to more towards a neutral. And when we look at a bunch of the quantitative measures that are sometimes predictive of different regimes, really nothing is out of line that's standing out. So while your while your your inclination might be very naturally to take a value tilt, um, I think, and I think that that over a long period of time will probably be productive. In the immediate term, um, until until the contractionary monetary policy gets gets restrictive, um, we probably don't see the value uh, growth dynamic changing. So we're looking at that. Uh, we've done a lot of research on, you know, again, what would change the regime. And if I were to boil it down to my favorite metric, it would probably be the, the, the state of um, Fed policy as really where value starts to bite a little bit more when that becomes restrictive. So we're going to hold off on making an all-in value bet, but I think it's something to watch. Great. We've gotten a few questions in around corporate tax cuts and how companies may spend some of the extra dollars that they have um, from those corporate tax cuts. Can you talk a little bit about what we're hearing from companies in regards to how they will be spending their tax cuts? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. The the tax cuts is, is something we're keeping an eye on. It comes up uh, on every earnings call. It comes up in our discussions with management. And there's a very varied response to that question, and it's and it's it's hard to generalize because each one is specific. But obviously, they have to give back between 
their various stakeholders, um, and of course, invest for growth. And, and in talking to them and also looking at some of the, uh, the, the economic data to support this, I would say most of it's going to come back in, in terms of returns to shareholders through either buybacks, repatriation, et cetera. That will some predominantly go back to shareholders. Some will be giving wage increases. That's a part of it. I don't expect a massive CapEx boom from this uh, because when you look at the CapEx cycle, it's actually the CapEx spending isn't as depressed when you look at it on a real basis that is adjusted for the deflation I, I referenced earlier that comes in from globalization. So CapEx is down on nominal terms, but not really in real terms. So I don't think they've been as underspending and underinvesting as you might uh, gather from reading in the paper. So I would say that um, the majority will come back to shareholders, Roman. Great. Garrett, we got a number of questions about the length of this cycle. You have been through many long cycles. Could you give us some perspective on what the position of the current cycle means to our advisors and our clients? Uh, thanks. Um, we're uh, from an investment asset allocation. Uh, we're at a fulcrum point. Uh, that means that change has to be recognized. And Matt, uh, Tom, Dave, myself, uh, we've been through 25 to 30 years of this, and it takes both uh, deep research and also uh, lots of uh, experience through lots of cycles to recognize that the change starts subtly. Um, and most investors don't recognize it until it's landed on their head and it's too late and they start justifying why they didn't do anything. Matt's articulated both the reasons why uh, and the actions we've taken within large cap and HDI and our uh, global fixed income. Those changes began uh, last year. They've added uh, meaningful alpha. We've measured it. Uh, we know it's brought uh, higher returns or less downside uh, to our client portfolios. Uh, so we're happy to communicate that to you. Uh, the value is also when we communicate it to our clients and uh, all of the advisor partners on this call, I know, uh, do that on a regular basis. And then finally, we're at that point where more changes uh, are coming, both within asset classes and at the asset allocation level. So we want to set those expectations. Great. Matt, you talked a little bit about dividend stocks a few slides ago. What is the outlook for dividend stocks going forward? Yeah, so dividend stocks have been under pressure this year. Um, so when you look at dividend stocks, there's three sources of returns. There's the yield you get, there's the growth in that yield, and of course there's a valuation. And what's happened is uh, the valuation that moves around, whereas the, the growth and the dividends are pretty steady. You get those over time, but the valuation can move quite quickly, and especially when you have uh, you know, a market that has quite a number of index funds uh, and uh, ETFs that will, will, will cause short-term dislocations. But when, you, when we disaggregate the sources uh, for dividend strategies, you know, in, in, in particular in the companies that we own, um, we, you know, the fundamentals there are, are intact. We're, the dividends are, in, are, are very solid and good shape, backed by high-quality balance sheets. Their growth, as I mentioned, we've been pivoting the portfolio uh, towards higher growers. So the growth rate in that dividend stream should actually inflect a bit up, given the changes that we're making and have been doing that for six or nine months. And so the valuation of late has been what's been the sort of the plug factor. And of course, uh, that can change on almost a daily basis. So we saw the market take down the valuation a little bit. So of course, it's getting more interesting. Um, it, they did that because they were extrapolating this rate rise into saying that it's, that it's going to, to keep going if, from best we can tell. And rates are going to be a lot higher, which would, of course, a challenge for uh, dividend stocks. But again, coming back to it, that's why we wanted to lay the economic foundation of the backdrop. Our outlook uh, is that rates were right in the middle of our range, and we feel that the valuations will, will eventually be fine uh, for rates in, this, in our range. So as a result, um, we 
hopefully the market will come to feeling more comfortable with that as we do. Uh, we expect that. And then we'll resume collecting our coupon, our dividends, uh, and getting the growth that we are adding into the portfolio. So you add that all together, and our outlook remains positive for that asset class. Yeah, and let me, uh, let me add um, investing in those dividend paying uh, the high income stocks uh, over a 15 year period uh, has resulted in 4.5 times return over that 15 year period. It's averaged exactly 7% over a 10 year period, uh, 6% over the recent five year period. And that 6 and 7% versus, say, corporate bonds, any type of corporate bond category is around 2 to 3%, so it's done basically 100% uh, better um, this year, uh, down 7. Doesn't surprise us, brings those longer-term returns, which were well above average for that 5- and 10-year period, right into the average zone. So uh, I think when you uh, look horizontally rather than just the first six months. The only other thing I would say is sentiment is uh, heavily influencing those. And our team, David Abella, David Shapiro, Tony Hugh, know their businesses uh, excellently like no other analysts. And while we don't know whether it's going to be a little bit more downside, uh, everybody that's been in that strategy knows it's an extremely uh, disciplined, low turnover, highly tax efficient, uh, good returning strategy. And it will absolutely outperform from today forward or even uh, any period, uh, the bonds that it uh, has been competing against. Back to you, Roman. Great. Thanks, Garrett. Matt, we got a question in around what our expectations are for margins going forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the, the stories that comes up quite a bit um, is about margins. And I touched on this briefly, but that's a great question because it comes up, um, especially when you talk about the CAPE ratio, what's our – what Margins reverting back to long-term averages would would be damaging for, for earnings. Um, the margins have surprised many people, especially you know uh, people who are not talking with uh, companies quite a bit. How sticky they've been, and, and many people have called for them to revert back to the mean. When we talk to companies, one thing that's clear: talk to any CEO. They are defending margins. They are they are absolutely committed to defending margins. Will will do anything they t they can at their power. Uh, they're investing in technologies. I mentioned earlier with the the stories that I talked about. So a very consistent theme is you know they'll they'll pound the table. We are going to defend margins. Um, it's really something that's front and center of mind. So this margin story I think is durable. Now that said, we just in the spirit of conservatism and caution, we, there are reasons to think that there'll be some, in particular, some cyclical forces that could pressure them. So in our forecast, we think, in our longer term forecast, margins might tick down some, but we don't think that they're going all the way back to where they were in prior cycles. We think this is a sustainable story. Great. Thanks, Matt. Garrett, we've seen some meetings take place between the North Korean and the South Korean leadership. Do you expect that to have any impact on the geopolitical risk speedometer? No. It's a non-factor for our uh, asset allocation. We're focused entirely on all of the points that Matt uh, has nicely articulated, and uh, that potential has no impact on our view. Right. You know, well, well, I should, if I, I should could, qualify yeah. that, I should qualify that only by the <laughs> what I should have. Uh, obviously, if st people start hitting buttons with bombs on them, yes, that will change our view. But in terms of a positive <laughs> outcome, uh, no, we don't expect anything to come from it. You know, and I would just add that if you look through history at all the quote unquote geopolitical events, uh, typically um, you overreact to those uh, at your own detriment. It's easy to see a, a scary headline and get nervous, but typically um, market recoveries from any, uh, or market drawdowns, I should say, from any geopolitical activities, not all, but, but many of them, and I would say the majority of them, are typically pretty short-lived. So I would you know, not look at a headline and, and all of a sudden react. I would definitely call us, talk us through, and help, you know, hopefully we can help put that in context for you. 
Uh, Matt, we, we got a question around whether we expect oil prices to have a negative impact on consumer spending. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Great question. I think the um, the oil prices at this point is pretty manageable. Um, there are enough um, puts and takes uh, that we think that oil prices will, will will stay somewhat in this range, maybe can, can continue to grind higher. But we're probably a ways away before the oil price uh, starts to really bite. Um, so we're tracking that. We see it. Um, there are offsets. There are some some substitutions that can happen in some part. Um, there are efficiencies that are gained, et cetera. So um, it's an issue. We're, we're watching it, uh, but we, at this point, don't see it uh, having a binding economic uh, uh, activity or constraint, I should say. Garrett, um, we got a question around whether we have any expectation around stock picking being replaced with index investing going forward. Matt spoke to this a little bit, but anything you'd like to add there? Yeah. Um, you have an eight, nine-year bull market and full beta all time, all, you know, 24-7, 365, uh, beats 70% of active managers. Um, our uh, one, three, and five-year large cap performance has outperformed the index, so we're not uh, in the uh, percent that has um, failed to beat the index during a bull market. Uh, during a bear market, uh, the odds actually reverse, where 67% of active managers beat the passive. Uh, I don't like to use the word over over uh, reaction, but the uh, reaction over the last several years to indexing um, is something that I would not uh, view as uh, sustainable. It doesn't mean that passive doesn't generate uh, beta returns. It's just uh, high net worth clients don't want beta all the time. They want uh, risk managed uh, beta. Uh, so uh, over the next three years, I think the odds are substantial that uh, active stock picking will be, the majority of those uh, will beat the index. And that's what we uh, have 30 years of confidence knowing high net worth clients don't want to go down as much as uh, the S&P uh, 500. In other asset classes, uh, EM uh, is a good example. You look at any of the indexes, the passive, um, uh, our performance uh, is 100% better uh, than those indexes over uh, the five-year period, actually about 90%, so let me be more specific. So indexes don't uh, do well in emerging market. They don't do well in high yield. They don't do well in any of the active uh, global bond index areas. So it has a good purpose. It uh, is an area that we accept as valid, uh, but now is not a time to be uh, doing that blindly or complacently. Great. You know, just well, just to add into that, if I could, um, you know, I did a few slides on that, looking at it from a valuation perspective. But just to add to the point that Garrett made in the beginning, which is, also, when you add in $4 trillion of QE, that that uh, that also is the beneficiary of index funds. So when you look at that active versus passive performance ratio, it improves significantly when uh, during contractionary monetary uh, periods. So I didn't want to overwhelm everybody with slides, but um, as the as the QE or accommodation gets removed, in particular the Fed balance sheet, uh, we should probably, that's another contributing factor to um, why passive uh, won't be the, the, quite the, the darling that it that has been. Great. Well, yeah, and let, actually, let's just pile on, uh, not intending to pile on, because we do see the benefits of passive. We like it. It serves many good purposes. Um, but uh, uh, what was it? The Larry Fink, uh, I think he runs uh, the biggest uh, passive fund. Uh, he basically said um, the application of passive has many good merits, and we completely adhere and agree with that. Their studies show the problem is investors use it inappropriately. They get in too late. They get out while it's down. So they actually don't uh, a fair number. I don't know if it's a majority of uh, investors that go and use this passive they do market timing or they do sector rotation or they move things around. Uh, and uh, this is Larry Fink's firm. They say, you know, 
good uh it's a good tool it's a good approach it has merit which we agree it's usually bad in application for some a meaningful percentage of investors so i just want to make that uh point and we don't working with our advisors uh suffer from that uh application right we're we're not moving in and out and jumping around and uh, we have a steady mind uh, and a steady hand and the behavioral component of that with clients is what our advisors do excellently. Great. Thanks, Garrett. Thanks, Matt. We're at the top of the hour, so I think we can end it here. We've covered a lot of ground today. Thank you all for joining us. A post-webinar survey will pop up shortly in your console. We appreciate your feedback and any suggestions you have for future webinar topics. If you have any questions or comments related to today's webinar, please feel free to contact us at info at cnr.com. You will receive an email notifying you when the replay becomes available within 24 hours. Have a great day, everyone.